uh, carried by uh, columns, and very uh, simplified, very uh, simple uh, names. And one thing that you will notice is that uh, there is no uh, vaulting in the uh, roofs uh, at all. Our friend doesn't like Romanesque architecture uh, either. Uh, she uh, gave a, a glance and she decided to uh, leave the room. So, Kat, you have another chance with the Gothic period and we'll see uh, tomorrow. So, uh, the uh, simplified interiors, devoid of uh, interior uh, the decoration, there are no mosaics uh, here. There are uh, no uh, fantastic you know, frescoes of any uh, kind. Very uh, limited decoration. And uh, it's almost uh, a bit like the uh, early uh, Christian uh, architecture, where the uh, pitched roof has uh, been uh, continuing together with some of the uh, classical uh, vocabulary which uh, persists. So the, uh, the experiment uh, in this way uh, went on in the pockets, uh, sometimes uh, no vestige, no sign of any classical culture whatsoever, uh, sometimes uh, limited memories uh, lingering as we uh, just uh, saw. But in uh, 800, Charlemagne, a uh, king uh, in uh, uh, Bavaria, uh, decided that he would uh, revive the uh, Roman Empire, but in the form of a Christianized Roman Empire. So, at the head of the Holy Roman Empire, with its uh, appellation, he uh, received a crown from the uh, Pope in uh, Rome. So, uh, under Charlemagne's empire, which did not live as long as the uh, Roman Empire, we have a, a more official uh, attempt, a more centralized attempt to uh, propagate and to uh, revive some of the uh, Roman uh, models and some of the uh, Roman uh, culture, both in architecture, in uh, the ruling of the uh, state, in uh, politics, and some other propagandistic acts, like having a, a chronicle a state uh, chronicle commissioned to uh, write the uh, story of uh, Charlemagne and uh, his, his uh, new uh, state. So uh, with uh, this, uh, the uh, Charlemagne uh, attempt was to utilize uh, some of the uh, methods that Augustus had done uh, in trying to create a uh, state uh, image. And uh, he... Uh, uh, propagated the uh, use of some of the uh, forms, especially <coughs> in his uh, palace uh, chapel in uh, Arkham, which was the uh, center. And uh, not far from uh, here, uh, the uh, abbey at Lorch is also uh, seen to uh, receive a triple uh, gateway, a bit like a, a triumphal Roman arch. And even though the inspiration is very clear, the source of the inspiration is very clear, no one would mistake this for a triumphal arch. It has a classical source in its uh, semicircular arches, its uh, unspoiled uh, uh, capitals uh, here, uh, normal uh, capitals in the classical uh, manner. But uh, other than that, the uh, attic is almost a full second uh, story. The polychromatic surface uh, articulation, together with the uh, zigzags and the uh, pilasters, uh, don't speak of the uh, direct classical uh, vocabulary that we are accustomed from Roman uh, times. Nevertheless, the source is very uh, clear. And this uh, clear source is even more apparent in the uh, Ella Chapelle which is the uh, uh, palace uh, chapel in uh, Arkham. And here the uh, octagonal uh, structure is uh, uh, harking back to uh, San Vitale uh, several uh, centuries ago. Uh, the uh, basic uh, germ, the basic uh, scheme of uh, organization is very much the uh, same. Uh, the uh, marbles are being uh, utilized to evoke something of the uh, former Roman imperial uh, richness. After all, this is the imperial <laughs> chapel, 
in uh, Aachen, but there is none of that uh, nuanced uh, sophistication that uh, we uh, saw in uh, some uh, Vital. Nevertheless, there is a uh, give and take between the uh, two. And uh, in this uh, sense, it is uh, useful to remind ourselves that the uh, Roman uh, architectural uh, vocabulary was instrumental in shaping the architecture both in the East, in the Byzantine Empire, and also in the uh, West, in Romanesque and uh, Gothic uh, Europe uh, from the 12th to the uh, 14th and 15th uh, centuries. But uh, the way uh, this uh, Roman influence was taken up in the East and the West is very, very uh, different. The uh, Byzantines uh, took the uh, Roman uh, dome and used it extensively in their uh, architecture, both in the Justinianic uh, period, as we uh, saw, when the uh, domed basilica was created, and then the uh, small compartmentalized uh, terms continued to be uh, used. But in the West, it wasn't the uh, dome, but the uh, basilica that was borrowed. So with the um, uh, Byzantine and then the Ottomans uh, following them, uh, the uh, dome became a, a focus of uh, the uh, architectural uh, design and the typologies. But in the uh, West, it was not so much the uh, dome, but the uh, basilical structure. The uh, basilica that uh, we uh, saw as a uh, neutral building uh, type in the basilica of uh, uh, Ultor in the Forum of uh, Trajan which had many columns inside, a forest of uh, columns. So the, uh, the variations of the uh, basilica, adding towers to it, uh, lengthening it, or adding aisles uh, to it, or uh, elaborating the uh, apse, the uh, eastern end, uh, every uh, the development in creating a new typology uh, from the uh, basilica to the Romanesque church and then to the Gothic uh, cathedral is a uh, variation <laughs> on the uh, basilica, not the uh, dome. So uh, one might uh, ask, uh, I mean, what dates that form? I mean, why was the uh, dome uh, preferred in uh, the uh, Byzantine uh, centuries? And why it was not favored in uh, the uh, West? Or uh, is it uh, vice versa? I mean, does the uh, liturgy the hierarchical uh, liturgy determine the architectural form, <laughs> or uh, does the uh, architectural you know, uh, form uh, derive ultimately from uh, that? It's, uh, it's a both two-sided uh, question. So uh, we uh, said that the uh, story of the uh, Romanesque uh, church and the Gothic cathedral is the uh, evolution and the development of the uh, plan and elevation of the uh, basilica. Well, the germinations of this uh, began in uh, monasteries. There are uh, several monasteries that uh, are on the record, uh, which are uh, centers of uh, monastic uh, life. The monastic life was uh, centered around uh, different uh, orders, uh, under uh, different uh, abbots. And so uh, there are the uh, Cluniacs, there are the Benedictines, there are the Cistercians, there are, I mean, uh, the almost the hundreds of large and small uh, orders, some of them uh, related. And uh, one of the uh, earliest uh, monastic establishments that we have is in uh, St. Gall, uh, G-A-L-L, in uh, Switzerland uh, today. And uh, you see that uh, this is uh, not a uh, city. And uh, one uh, price that was uh, paid after the uh, demolition and disintegration of the Roman uh, Empire in the uh, West was that the urbanization uh, disappeared. The uh, settlements that we uh, now see are uh, introverted, they are uh, smaller in uh, size, <coughs> they are uh, more uh, feudal. And uh, when we uh, look at uh, monumental uh, architecture like this, like the uh, church in St. Gall uh, Monastery, we don't see it as an uh, urban you know, uh, center, as a, a focus in a, a crowded uh, city, 
but a rather uh, secluded and uh, uh, characterized uh, establishment serving a uh, religious style of uh, life. The uh, monastery in uh, St. Gaul was self-sufficient. It didn't uh, depend on uh, external uh, supplies in any kind of way. It generated its own uh, economy. It uh, grew its own uh, food. It had its own uh, animals. And it had a very uh, regimented, severe uh, lifestyle, which was based on simplicity. The monks, the monks rose early in the morning. Uh, they had a rather ritualistic way of uh, life. And during the uh, day, every phase of the uh, life was uh, characterized by some kind of uh, prayer and some kind of uh, liturgical uh, uh, worship within the uh, church. So it is not surprising that the uh, church, as it uh, evolved, is the uh, focus of the uh, monastery and all the other uh, units that we uh, see within the uh, monastery are uh, part of this uh, establishment. Uh, the uh, dormitories where the uh, monks uh, slept and the uh, receptories <coughs> where they had uh, collective uh, meals in the morning, uh, in the afternoon, and perhaps in the evening uh, as well. Uh, even at St. Gaul in this uh, early uh, period, we uh, see that the uh, basilical uh, church is uh, undergoing a uh, change. Uh, it is no longer the uh, modest uh, early Christian basilica, and it is no longer the pagan basilica of the uh, Romans. For one thing, we see a vertical uh, thrust. Towers are being added, a uh, feature which does not exist in the early Christian uh, church. And if the Romans and the Byzantines had their uh, domes, perhaps as a compensation rising heavenward, uh, we have the uh, towers in these uh, Western uh, churches in, in uh, Europe. Uh, the uh, towers are uh, placed at the uh, ends, uh, usually uh, double uh, towers. And frequently, there is also a uh, tower which is placed at the crossing the uh, crossing of the main uh, nave and the uh, transverse, uh, the transept, uh, creating a uh, joining uh, point, which is uh, defined uh, further and accentuated with a central uh, tower. So you have a longitudinal uh, axis, uh, and then you have the uh, towers, which uh, signal the presence of the uh, church and which uh, emphasize its importance and the presence within the uh, small monastic uh, establishment. So the, uh, the main uh, uh, church building itself is quite longitudinal. You have the, uh, the nave, and then you have the uh, aisles, and then uh, in this you know, uh, case, you have the uh, apses uh, together with the uh, towers, and then the uh, crossing in the uh, center. But uh, other than the uh, towers, we don't see too much of an uh, intervention within the actual uh, plan at this uh, very uh, early uh, stage. Uh, to uh, see it uh, even uh, better, uh, you uh, see the uh, towers, the uh, apse. The apse does not flow outside the uh, perimeter of the uh, uh, aisles and the uh, name, uh, and there are uh, some uh, small uh, additions. And I draw your uh, attention at this early stage to the uh, wooden uh, roof. Uh, this is another uh, point. The uh, Romanesque builders were interested in the stone uh, structures. Uh, since there was no uh, the, uh, centralized uh, organization that would uh, organize the uh, quarrying the transportation and the hoisting of large blocks of uh, worked stone, like the Romans uh, did, the uh, stones that would be carried would have to be uh, fit to be uh, carried on uh, donkeys or, or you know, uh, horses. Uh, so small-sized you know, stones were uh, utilized for uh, the uh, walls, 
and also for the uh, roof in order to uh, prevent uh, fires which were uh, frequent. Another reason for preferring uh, uh, later on uh, stone uh, roofs was to uh, be able to surmount the uh, span that was uh, limited by the length of the uh, available timber, tall uh, trees. And they had to work uh, on this. Uh, and we have a uh, the story uh, which uh, goes on to become more and more uh, uh, sophisticated. These uh, monasteries are all over uh, Europe. In the Saint Martin, in the Canigou, also in the France, you see a rather uh, secluded uh, monastery. Secluded in the true uh, sense because it is relegated to the uh, uh, mountains. Its uh, access is not very uh, easy and not even uh, invited. This is a very uh, special community of, of uh, people. And uh, in it, the uh, different <laughs> requirements of uh, the uh, monastic uh, living are all uh, squeezed into the uh, limited uh, space that is uh, available on the uh, rather difficult uh, topography that is uh, available on top of a uh, hill. And all is uh, organized around a, a cloister, which is a, a courtyard, which uh, organizes the uh, church, the uh, main you know, uh, chapel, the uh, dormitories and the uh, uh, refectories. In St. Martha in the Canigou, we see uh, a, a development uh, of the uh, stone uh, architecture, which became such a central concern to uh, Romanesque architects. Uh, we uh, said that uh, the Romanesque architects took the uh, Roman basilical uh, plan and then they took the uh, you know, uh, arch and uh, they uh, developed these uh, further. And uh, in St. Martin in Canigo, uh, you see that uh, they are already uh, experimenting with the uh, groin uh, vaults, which the Romans had in their baths that you have uh, seen. Uh, they are also uh, consolidating the uh, Roman uh, piers, uh, uh, strengthening them in order to have a, a carrying uh, capacity. They're uh, building them, uh, giving a complex uh, section to the uh, peers. And uh, throughout the Romanesque architecture, uh, what we uh, observe is uh, a, a move from the uh, more uh, sturdy, the more you know, uh, massive, to the point of awkwardness uh, even, gradually becoming more slender, more refined, and uh, higher when uh, this experiment ultimately uh, culminates in the, uh, do, uh, the, the uh, Gothic uh, cathedral. So the Roman uh, pier, which was very, very uh, simple, uh, went down in stone. Uh, you must remember that these people are not utilizing Pozzolana. The lessons of Pozzolana were long gone. Uh, what they are utilizing when they hop back to the Roman uh, lessons is uh, the uh, stone uh, masonry, the craft of stone uh, masonry. <coughs> so they take the uh, Roman uh, pier with the uh, rectangular uh, section, which is very, very uh, simple, and uh, they try to uh, uh, widen it in order that it becomes more uh, supportive. And when you uh, widen the Roman uh, pier, you need a wooden uh, section during the uh, construction you know, period of the uh, arch. Uh, but if you have too wide uh, and, uh, you know, uh, pier, then uh, it will not be you know, supported. In the Byzantine architecture, both in the early and later uh, periods, we saw that uh, all the uh, surfaces, the springs, the under surfaces of arches and tunnel vaults were utilized for mosaic. In the uh, Romanesque architecture, there was no such thing. It was simply a structural expedience, awkward at first, in order to uh, overcome concerns of uh, engineering, concerns of uh, structure, and uh, the, in uh, time to uh, lighten the uh, pier. So basically, uh, what happens is that the square section of the uh, Roman uh, pier is uh, converted 
into the uh, sophisticated uh, moldings of the uh, molded uh, pier that we have in the uh, Romanesque all the way into <coughs> the uh, Gothic uh, architecture. So uh, what happens with the uh, molded the pier of the uh, Romanesque is the um, application of uh, several um, uh, arches uh, which have uh, different uh, centers. So, so you have several arches which are put side by side together. And in that regard, the uh, centering that is uh, required for each one of the uh, arches, or the <laughs> highest uh, arch, is uh, the rather uh, thin. Uh, you don't need uh, enormous uh, quantities of uh, wood. And then you have a uh, articulation within the uh, main structural uh, body. This is not an applied decoration, but structure itself is manipulated to uh, become uh, decorative. So in some ways, it's a very honest kind of uh, architecture, because nothing is uh, applied. The stone that is used for uh, construction is also the uh, stone, the very stone, that tends to uh, articulate the individual architectural uh, members and elements used in the uh, church. In the uh, Romanesque uh, church, what we uh, usually uh, have is a, a tripartite uh, nave on both uh, sides. Uh, you have the, uh, the gallery uh, here, or the uh, arcade, which is the uh, first level. The uh, second level is what we call a triforium, which we shall uh, see. And then there is the uh, third level, which is the uh, clerestory, which allows the light to come uh, in. So this uh, three-tiered uh, three, uh, uh, articulation uh, receives uh, an incredible uh, array of uh, solutions. Sometimes you have a, a squat arcade. Sometimes you have an uh, airy, you know, a light tutorium. Uh, sometimes the uh, clerestory is uh, squinched. So trying to uh, decide how these elements uh, come uh, together is a, uh, a concern which is both uh, structural uh, as well as uh, spatial, because the character, uh, the airiness or the uh, dimness uh, or the uh, darkness of the uh, main central uh, name will be uh, affected uh, by uh, this. And uh, usually, the uh, molded uh, pier is uh, utilized, as you see uh, here, to uh, create you know, higher uh, arches. Uh, and the perforation of the uh, eyes on the uh, outside allows the uh, oblique light to uh, come uh, in. And there are many variations. Sometimes the tunnel vault is used. Sometimes the uh, groin vault of the uh, Romans is uh, taken. And then the groin vault becomes even uh, more sophisticated, turning into a uh, rib vault. So the barrel vault that you are familiar with, uh, sometimes known as the uh, tunnel vault, is uh, quite uh, common in these uh, early Romanesque experiments. <coughs> so much so that uh, not only the aisles, but also the central nave will uh, sometimes use the uh, tunnel vault. Uh, and then, uh, in addition to the uh, tunnel uh, vault, the uh, growing vault of the uh, Romans is another uh, popular structural uh, unit for the uh, Romanesque church. Uh, you remember that the uh, growing vault is the intersection of uh, corresponding uh, barrel uh, vaults, and uh, this uh, receives uh, variations. And as a uh, result, throughout the Romanesque and the Gothic uh, period, uh, both the tunnel vault and then the uh, groin vault, by being stacked together, sometimes uh, consolidated with transverse uh, arches, uh, are trying to get a more airy you know, uh, nave with these molded uh, piers or applied uh, pilasters. They are trying to become uh, higher and uh, higher with uh, more uh, attenuated, more verticalized, and more uh, sort of uh, thinly uh, articulated, verticalized uh, piers at the uh, arcade uh, level. And uh, the uh, story of uh, working out the uh, variations 
of the uh, uh, three-story uh, nave uh, interior is basically uh, the main uh, story which affects the uh, overall uh, uh, perception of the uh, church. Uh, while this is uh, going on, we said that uh, the uh, apse was uh, another uh, major characteristic. The uh, apse is uh, often given an ambulatory, a uh, covered uh, corridor, which makes it uh, possible to uh, circulate within the uh, apse. And uh, the uh, names, uh, I mean the uh, aisles, uh, also allow you know, circulation, which sometimes, uh, as we shall see uh, shortly, continue in a unified manner to the uh, native, but not always. That happens in uh, a special uh, church that we call the uh, pilgrimage church. So we have the uh, nave, which is the uh, major uh, element, the uh, backbone of the uh, church. The nave is uh, flanked by the two aisles on both sides. Nothing is uh, very different than the early Christian uh, basilica uh, here. And then you have a crossing uh, element, the uh, transept uh, element uh, here, uh, creating a uh, cross uh, axis, uh, which is uh, covered with a uh, tower at the uh, crossing, and uh, uh, giving a verticality uh, to the uh, church, both in the exterior and also in the uh, interior, by uh, working on the uh, variations of the uh, interior uh, elevation. This um, uh, apse area uh, is uh, the very uh, crucial. Uh, from the uh, early uh, Romanesque period onwards, continuously, there is an elaboration of the uh, apse. Uh, chapels, small uh, chapels, are added to the uh, apse uh, sometimes the uh, chapels protrude to the uh, outside, as you see uh, here, and uh, they become so elaborate in the Gothic uh, period that uh, the <coughs> whole uh, area uh, here becomes known as the uh, chevet, C-H-E-V-E-T. Uh, so, on the one hand, you have the uh, uh, verticalization on the outside and in the uh, interior, depending on how they can uh, navigate the uh, structural uh, system. And on the other hand, the apse is becoming a more elaborate uh, 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 liturgical uh, uh, solution for the uh, Christian uh, worship in this uh, sense. So in a way, uh, in the uh, East, the uh, liturgical uh, hierarchy was represented by the uh, dome where you saw uh, all the you know, uh, mosaics uh, that we have seen in uh, especially St. Saviour in the uh, Kora. But uh, here, uh, the uh, apse, the uh, shove, and the uh, chapels radiating from the uh, apse start to uh, receive the uh, brunt of the uh, liturgy, while uh, the rest is the you know, congregational uh, space. So there is this uh, constant uh, evolution. It all started in a very uh, basic way in uh, San Clemente in uh, Rome, a uh, 12th century uh, church. But uh, this uh, 12th century uh, church, San Clemente in uh, Rome, is actually uh, based on a 4th century uh, church. Uh, it was an early Christian uh, basilica, and then the early Christian uh, basilica was made more uh, elaborate. And if you uh, look at the uh, uh, overall you know, uh, plan of this uh, church uh, here, uh, you might uh, uh, initially mistake it for an early Christian uh, basilica. But if you look uh, more carefully and have a, a closer uh, look, you will see that there are uh, changes. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there was an uh, atrium or a uh, enclosed uh, the courtyard where the uh, people you know, came in from the uh, outside. They could congregate here for the ablutions and then enter the uh, church. But uh, the uh, church with the simple apse or the side apses 
the uh, name and the uh, IELTS, has started to uh, receive uh, the, some other uh, elements. The uh, apps and the elaboration of the uh, apps is beginning to flow into the uh, nave. I mean, there's a, a choir here. Uh, the uh, apps is uh, articulated with uh, certain uh, elements, but that is not enough. So the uh, choir receives the uh, walls. Uh, there are these uh, spared uh, places. These are uh, pulpits. Uh, one is for the gospel, and the other is for the you know uh, epistles. And uh, the encroachment into uh, the uh, nave starts to take uh, place. So again, uh, what we uh, see is the elaboration of the east end, the elaboration of the uh, apse. It is, uh, in this case, in San Clemente, an encroachment into the uh, nave space. And there are not yet the uh, radiating uh, chapels or the uh, exterior expansion of the uh, apse uh, at all. And you see it better uh, here. This is the normal uh, nave uh, space. And uh, what would normally have been the space of the uh, apse is uh, flowing uh, into the uh, uh, nave, taking up some of the uh, space uh, there with these uh, pulpits for the uh, epistles and uh, the, the uh, gospels uh, by uh, enclosing it in a, a special uh, way. So uh, that is uh, an encroachment into the uh, nave uh, space. And this was not repeated uh, later, and the apse itself uh, started to become uh, more uh, elaborate uh, later, as we see in Saint Philibert in Tourno, which is in uh, France. In Saint Philibert in uh, Tourno, when you look at the uh, apse, it is almost like a different uh, church uh, building. It has its own uh, ambulatory, <coughs> it has become rather uh, elaborate with its uh, niches, but beyond the uh, ambulatory, in St. Philibert in Turin, you have the radiating uh, chapels. Yes, they are uh, uh, angled, they are these square you know, chapels that uh, emanate from the uh, apse here, uh, but uh, they show uh, very, very uh, clearly the uh, elaboration of the uh, apse, the eastern end, for uh, liturgical <laughs> uh, purposes. And uh, in the uh, St. Philibert in the Turno, uh, you uh, see that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, aisles are uh, receiving the uh, groin walls. The uh, center is uh, still not very uh, articulated, but the uh, overall uh, area of the, uh, the apse is very different than uh, San uh, Clemente, because encroachment is not into the uh, nave, but it is uh, expanding uh, outward. Uh, the uh, structural uh, experiments are also uh, continuing. In order to uh, carry uh, the uh, uh, piers, uh, sometimes you have uh, square cylindrical uh, piers, sometimes you have square ones. We can tell this is an early uh, example because the moldings are not there uh, yet. Uh, we have rather massive uh, cylinders, which are not uh, articulated into these uh, slender vertical uh, moldings from which the uh, uh, walls uh, spring. It's still uh, quite the uh, Roman uh, looking. The uh, groin walls are very uh, simple. You have uh, barrel walls, uh, tunnel walls, juxtaposed with the uh, groin uh, walls. So they're experimenting. They're creating strong, durable uh, structures, but the uh, finesse and the uh, vertical elaboration and the uh, transparency that we begin to see uh, later is still not uh, there. Uh, in this example uh, as well, uh, you can see a certain solidity. And Romanesque is uh, known for this uh, solidity. And usually, uh, you can tell the Romanesque you know, uh, churches from the uh, Gothic uh, churches uh, in terms of this uh, solidity. The uh, verticality of uh, the uh, uh, cylindrical uh, columns is uh, uh, quite uh, emphatic uh, here. 
But still, because there are no moldings on the uh, piers, that uh, verticality uh, visually is uh, not so uh, emphatic, and it will become so uh, later. The uh, name is covered uh, still uh, with this uh, very um, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, not uh, confident uh, the outlook, because there are transverse uh, arches which tend to uh, consolidate at uh, various uh, points. And uh, what you have is uh, basically a, a tunnel uh, vault. The uh, groin vault is uh, not turned into a, a rib vault uh, yet. So like the uh, Kuros and Koren uh, statues, whose development you could uh, follow, even the uh, untrained eye can tell an uh, early you know, Romanesque uh, church from a uh, later uh, one, looking at the uh, degree of you know, finesse, the degree of you know, transparency, the degree of you know, awkwardness, the degree of solidity and uh, uh, massiveness. It's quite easy to uh, tell. But ultimately, the uh, aim is to uh, work on heightening the uh, nave. It tries to get higher and higher and uh, higher, and then uh, covering uh, everything with uh, stone. This is the uh, art par excellence of the stone uh, mason. Uh, the uh, art of uh, working with uh, small you know, uh, stones as a construction and decorative uh, material and structural uh, material uh, reaches a new uh, peak. The uh, basic uh, configuration, uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier, is the uh, arcade or the uh, gallery. Then there's a middle level uh, known as the uh, triforium. And then you have a uh, the, the lit up you know area, which is normally the uh, clarest story, and uh, this uh, receives uh, countless uh, variations. Uh, the uh, uh, height and the width you know the, of this is often uh, regulated with the height and width of the uh, aisles because the uh, aisles will also uh, support and receive the uh, thrusts which emanate from, from the uh, nave. So uh, the uh, architects were uh, engineers. I mean, the uh, stonemasons were uh, engineers. And if uh, they uh, calculated their stresses uh, with a uh, mistake, then uh, they would encounter a uh, disaster. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, medieval chronicles are full of stories of unfinished or collapsed uh, churches. Uh, there was a lot of trial and error in uh, trying to make your church stand and uh, making your church higher than you know, other churches and making it more transparent, thinner, and uh, more uh, elegant. And then, uh, in the end, uh, you uh, articulate the uh, stone, the openings become uh, you know, larger, and uh, as we uh, get more and more into the uh, Gothic, increasingly, uh, not so semicircular, but pointed uh, arches are uh, being uh, used, which give an added you know, slenderness and greater you know, verticality to the uh, elevation of the uh, church. Uh, uh, here uh, you see that the uh, uh, tunnel vault is uh, not uh, being uh, used. There are uh, groin uh, vaults, and the groin uh, vaults are receiving uh, ribs to uh, articulate them, uh, to uh, delineate them even uh, further, and to make them uh, seem as if they're uh, stemming from tall, thin uh, pilasters, giving a vertical continuity all the way from the uh, crown to the point of spring of the uh, groin uh, vaults. And the two-part-type division is uh, here. You see the uh, gallery or the uh, arcade, which is quite high, and defined with the uh, molded uh, piers, having pilasters and uh, arches, um, uh, reducing the uh, thickness uh, underneath the uh, wall because of these molded uh, arches, which are placed you know, side by side. And then you have the triforium, uh, which is quite high in this instance. And then you have the uh, terrestrial uh, lighting on, uh, on the top. 
the uh, overall uh, theme that you uh, have here is uh, not very dark. And increasingly, uh, these uh, churches start to become uh, lighter uh, in the interior too. They are not these uh, dark, you know, uh, mysterious, uh, forbidding uh, spaces, but with the uh, arrangement of the uh, perforations, the uh, light that uh, can uh, come in, either from the uh, crossing, which is, you know, uh, high, or from the cluster lighting, or from the uh, perforation of the aisle walls on the outside, which trickles in into the uh, nave, you can get very <laughs> different uh, arrangements. And these were going on in uh, France, in uh, Germany, in uh, England. In the Durham uh, Cathedral in uh, England, uh, we have a uh, rather uh, typical uh, Romanesque uh, church, uh, quite uh, massive and uh, simple. Uh, long uh, and uh, narrow a uh, nave with uh, the flankings of the uh, aisles. And uh, there is a uh, continuity which is uh, interrupted. Uh, you have the uh, nave you know, continuing here. Uh, the uh, transept interrupts that but there is a crossing and a uh, simple uh, uh, apse here, which is not very elaborated. The uh, columns are uh, molded in a section. Uh, you see there's a molded, you know, appears here. They are juxtaposed with uh, more, you know, uh, curved linear uh, uh, columns. And in that uh, case, there are uh, articulations on the uh, surface of the uh, columns. But uh, despite the uh, moldings that you uh, see in uh, the uh, uh, definition of the art nave, there's still uh, quite a solidity uh, here. It still looks rather uh, massive. When you look at this uh, church, and when you look at the uh, roof that is uh, being uh, carried uh, above the uh, arcade, the uh, triforium, and then the uh, clerestory, uh, the, uh, the, the, the rising of the uh, uh, vertical uh, elements, <laughs> which are not structural, but uh, which continue the visual line into the uh, uh, drawing wall, still uh, do not uh, uh, reduce that element of uh, massiveness. I know they would say, oh, what a high you know, uh, church, when we uh, look at the uh, examples that uh, will come uh, later in the Gothic uh, period. Uh, the question to uh, ask at this uh, point is, if there was no uh, central uh, authority, like uh, a strong empire, uh, like the Roman uh, Empire, or uh, if the uh, uh, sphere of influence of Charlemagne was rather uh, limited, how did this uh, knowledge of uh, building how did the knowledge of typologists and plants, uh, you know, uh, become a distributor? An important uh, element uh, here is the uh, pilgrimage uh, routes, the uh, routes to uh, sacred centers throughout uh, Europe. They were uh, very well known uh, routes, the uh, Via Turonensis or the uh, Camino Frances, via Tolosana or, you know, uh, whatever. But one of the uh, best known uh, routes was uh, the one uh, that went to uh, the uh, Compostela, you know, uh, churches. And you see that along the uh, pilgrimage uh, routes, uh, there were uh, well-known uh, churches. So uh, the uh, pilgrims felt it a, a challenge. It's a bit like uh, going to Mecca uh, today. The uh, ambition of uh, many uh, Muslims all over the uh, Muslim world, including uh, Turkey, is uh, to go to uh, Mecca at least uh, once and uh, to become a, a Hajj. Uh, nowadays, uh, it is slightly easier. I mean, there are organized uh, tours. You uh, get your name in the uh, official uh, quota. You get on a plane. And then, uh, yes, you are in the crowd, and uh, it is uh, hot, and uh, if you are uh, old in age, it might not be a very easy uh, experience. 
But still, compared with older times, when you have to travel many, many you know, uh, kilometers, it is a considerably easy uh, task. And when we uh, look at uh, medieval uh, Europe, the Europe of uh, the 12th uh, centuries and uh, beyond, uh, the uh, routes were uh, full, not of uh, soldiers, like the Roman you know, uh, soldiers, but pilgrims. Uh, groups and groups of uh, pilgrims traveled uh, many, many months from uh, one part of Europe to the other uh, part of Europe to uh, go to the uh, sacred uh, centers. So these uh, much traveled routes also became routes to the traveling uh, stone uh, masons who uh, carried uh, not only uh, know-how but ideas of what they saw in uh, various you know, uh, centers so uh, the, while there are all these you know, churches, uh, some of them uh, very uh, small, uh, some of them you know, uh, larger, some of them are uh, very well-known uh, churches. Like uh, you know, Chartres may not be on the pilgrimage route exactly, but it's very close to uh, Paris. Then you have uh, Tours, you have Poitiers, you have uh, Olney, uh, Bordeaux, uh, these are well-known, you know, uh, churches coming to the Saint Jacques de uh, Compostela or Santiago de uh, Compostela, and then there are other uh, routes leading to uh, Conk, for example, the Queen. That's a very you know, famous uh, church. So um, a type which is known as the pilgrimage churches began to uh, rise in uh, Europe. And looking at these as a pilgrimage of churches, I mean, no one is exactly uh, identical, but you see that uh, they share a certain uh, common uh, characteristics. For one thing, they all have the radiating uh, chapels. Uh, the uh, apse has uh, received an you know, ambulatory with the radiating uh, chapels in all of them. And uh, all of them, uh, because they are pilgrimage churches, and uh, a purpose in the pilgrimage church is to uh, get the uh, pilgrims into the church and allow them access to as many parts as possible. So the ambulators uh, become unified in the pilgrimage churches. And in all of these uh, pilgrimage churches, you have the uh, ambulatories that continue all around without the interruption of the you know, uh, crossing uh, points, that the pilgrims could move all the way to the uh, Sheve and uh, around the uh, aisles coming to the uh, nave. And uh, these uh, ambulatories, the continuous uh, ambulatories, tend to uh, unify the uh, interior of, of the uh, church. And it's not surprising that they are so uh, similar. And one of the most uh, famous uh, of them is the uh, Santiago de Compostela, written exactly as I uh, said. And uh, <coughs> in the Santiago de Compostela, you see all the basic characters of a pilgrimage uh, church. The uh, uh, radiating uh, chapels in the uh, apse, the uh, developed uh, uh, descender here, and then the ambulatories, which uh, continue all around the uh, church. The uh, chapels are extended even to the transept, not just uh, in the Shebet part, but the uh, transept also has uh, chapels. In fact, when you uh, look at the radiating uh, chapels of here, it's almost as if uh, the uh, eastern end of the uh, church is uh, competing with the rest of the church. I mean, look at the elaboration here. We are looking at this part of uh, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, and you have the uh, towers on both you know, sides, and then the tower at the uh, crossing, the uh, pitched roof for the uh, transept, and the main you know, uh, nave uh, don't you know, catch the uh, attention uh, that much. So a uh, typology is uh, developing. But if you look at the uh, inside, of the Santiago de Compostela uh, here, uh, you uh, notice that it is uh, rather uh, dim. Uh, the, you uh, have the uh, light coming in from this uh, crossing uh, here, 
the uh, height and uh, the, uh, the perforation of the tower at the uh, crossing allows the uh, light to uh, come into the church, as you see uh, here. But uh, what is uh, here that you don't see? There's something uh, missing uh, here. <laughs> Anyone? What is uh, missing here if you look at this uh, elevation? The moldings. The moldings. Yes, uh, the uh, moldings, uh, they are continuous. They continue uh, from the floor all the way to the uh, top. And you have the stories. Absolutely. What is your name? Özge. <laughs> so thank you, Özge. Thank you, Özge. As Özge has uh, so uh, astutely uh, observed, uh, what we have here is the uh, absence of the triforium. The triforium has uh, disappeared. It's a variation, uh, and uh, so the uh, vaulting. Uh, rests uh, uh, directly, I mean, uh, I mean, sorry, the clerestory has disappeared, so the uh, vaulting uh, rests uh, directly on the um, uh, tiforium. As a result, the clerestory uh, lighting is not so uh, effective, and you have this uh, uh, well of uh, light that comes from the uh, crossing. This is a variation, I mean, why uh, it is uh, like that, we don't know. But it seems to be a uh, characteristic of uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, churches uh, that uh, we have in the uh, pilgrimage uh, route, whether it be uh, Spain or uh, France, the typology of the uh, pilgrimage uh, church. And sorry, this is uh, reverse, but it's Saint Martin in the tour, a, a French uh, church. And again, uh, you uh, see uh, the uh, similar characteristic with the radiating uh, chapel, the uh, transept, and, and the uh, crossing uh, here. So the type uh, the develops. Uh, but when we uh, uh, look into uh, several uh, other you know, uh, examples, we see that the uh, quest for uh, height is um, an uh, enduring uh, one. Uh, in uh, Saint Serna, in the Toulouse here, a rather uh, peculiar example of uh, a very attenuated tower, which doesn't really affect the interior of the uh, church, uh, gives uh, definition to the uh, exterior significance and the presence of the uh, church. And uh, you see that uh, Saint Serna <coughs> is no longer a little abbey uh, church. It is not in a secluded uh, countryside or uh, a, uh, a mountain uh, top, but it is in the uh, city. And uh, for that uh, reason, the uh, exterior verticality is a uh, external uh, symbol which marks the uh, significance of the uh, religious authority within the town within the medieval uh, town. So the uh, town fabric is uh, organized around the uh, church. The church is not in the edge of the town. It is in the center of town, the focus of the uh, town. So uh, you see the uh, church uh, increasingly uh, attaining a uh, significance within the uh, daily uh, life. But while this was uh, going on, some of the, uh, the, the orders, some of the uh, well-known uh, orders, started to grow enormously. One of these was the Cluniac order, the order of uh, Cluny. And uh, the uh, church of uh, Cluny, as a uh, result, also uh, grew. I mean, like uh, the very early monastery of uh, St. Gaul, which we you know, uh, saw. Uh, Saint uh, Cluny also initially had the same uh, premises, uh, the uh, church proper, the uh, focus, uh, the uh, cloister, uh, the uh, forecourts, uh, the stables, uh, service courts for the uh, animals, and all the uh, necessities that were uh, required to sustain the uh, daily uh, life of a group of uh, monks engaged in the prayer, engaged in the cultivation of uh, uh, crops and, and uh, animals. Uh, but uh, the uh, Cluny order 
was also becoming very, very uh, rich. And uh, as it became uh, richer, uh, challenging other uh, authorities, we see this uh, richness uh, being uh, uh, reflected in the uh, sophistication of the uh, church building, higher uh, the towers, uh, more uh, elaborate uh, eastern uh, ends, and uh, also uh, affecting the uh, life of the uh, society and corruption. I mean, uh, when you uh, expand uh, the, in a very uncontrolled uh, manner, uh, the, it is inevitable that uh, there will be uh, dissociations from the uh, central uh, idea that was present in the uh, initial uh, stance. And so it is not surprising that uh, as a reaction to the uh, Cluny, the uh, Cistercians come up with uh, more simplified uh, churches. If the early Christian uh, church was a, a reaction against the uh, Roman profligacy, uh, as a result of uh, rejecting some of the uh, Roman you know, uh, forms in choice of greater you know, simplicity, uh, the uh, uh, appearance of some Cistercian uh, churches was also a, a reaction against the uh, Cluniacs. But first, let us look uh, at the Cluniac uh, church in greater uh, detail. Uh, we see that the uh, eastern end, the Sheve, with the uh, radiating chapels from the apse, the radiating uh, chapels from the uh, transept, uh, and uh, this uh, being reflected uh, also in the uh, double main uh, transept in the uh, center, uh, makes the uh, church uh, really articulated uh, from the uh, outside. And uh, the uh, flowering, the uh, flowing of uh, the uh, Sheve uh, outward is um, uh, very different than inward flow that we saw uh, in a very limited manner in uh, San Clemente in uh, Rome. Looking at the uh, model, uh, the uh, basilical uh, church is almost an addition. The uh, Sheve has uh, developed to such an extent that there is almost a competition <coughs> between uh, this part of the church and that part of the church. <coughs> the, uh, the crossing, the articulation of the uh, crossing with uh, the, the, the triple you know, uh, towers, as a matter of fact, is not sufficient to uh, integrate the uh, basilical uh, component with the uh, over you know, emphatic and over you know, flowing uh, chevet uh, part. And while uh, this is uh, going on as an uh, observation, there is uh, also the effort to make the you know, uh, church a bit you know, uh, higher, uh, going you know, higher uh, up, but uh, again, it is not as high as some of the uh, Gothic churches that we have uh, seen. In contrast to this, when we uh, look at uh, this uh, church here, uh, the uh, Fontenay uh, Abbey, uh, you see uh, not the uh, uh, early uh, Romanesque, uh, the uh, simplicity of uh, uh, lack of uh, experience or experimentation at an early uh, stage, but you see a, a deliberate uh, rejection of this uh, elaboration, this uh, arch architectural extravaganza that uh, became a uh, symbol of the uh, Cluniacs. And uh, this uh, church at uh, Fontenay, which is a Cistercian abbey, a different uh, the order, is very, very uh, simple. Uh, the, uh, the, the vault is a uh, tunnel vault, slightly uh, pointed, but uh, rather uh, simple, uh, not uh, articulated well uh, at all. And uh, what is more, when you look at the elaboration of the uh, Eastern uh, end, the uh, chevet, it does not even have uh, the uh, uh, curvilinear uh, chapels. It has become rather solid and uh, massive with uh, these uh, little uh, chapels tacked on uh, in this uh, manner. Uh, in uh, plan, the Fontenay Abbey, in principle, is the same as uh, St. Gaul and uh, Cluny. There is a uh, church, which is uh, the uh, main building, 
there is the uh, cloister, uh, the uh, open uh, uh, courtyard, uh, which uh, allows the uh, congregation of the uh, uh, monks, but which also tends to uh, organize the various uh, units in addition to the uh, church. Uh, the uh, living room, in a way, uh, of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, abbey in this uh, sense, was the uh, courtyard. I mean, the uh, people in the uh, various uh, units, the uh, dormitories, the refectories, or the you know, uh, church, all were uh, united in the uh, courtyard, the uh, cloister, as they went from one uh, building to the uh, other. But looking at the uh, church of the uh, Cistercian you know, uh, Abbey at uh, Fontenay, you see that uh, the uh, apse is uh, rectilinear. There are no radiating uh, chapels uh, here. And the uh, inside of the uh, church is rather uh, simple. So the uh, variations between the uh, orders, and in this case, the uh, Cluniacs and the uh, uh, Cistercians is very uh, easily uh, traceable within the uh, churches. Another Cistercian you know, church is in Pontigny. You don't need to remember these uh, names. In the Pontigny, you don't have a, a square apse as in uh, Fontenay. I mean, uh, this is a very uh, simplified apse uh, here. In uh, Pontigny, it is uh, a more curvilinear uh, apse. Uh, uh, but still, uh, it doesn't uh, extend a, um, a sophisticated <coughs> spatial uh, or volumetric personality as we saw in the uh, Cluniac uh, version. It uh, grows uh, out of the uh, nave and the you know, aisles in this uh, way. It uh, radiates and uh, envelopes and uh, defines the you know, uh, apse. But that is all. There is none of that extravaganza of overflowing radiating uh, chapels. The radiating uh, chapels have been uh, reduced to an uh, absolute uh, minimum. There is one final uh, element that we uh, need to uh, uh, mention in terms of the uh, Romanesque and also uh, Gothic uh, uh, churches. And that is the uh, uh, didactic and visual uh, value of the uh, iconography. Uh, the um, surface of the uh, church, whether it be the mold of the pier, whether it be the uh, entrance to the church, uh, whether it be some of the uh, capitals that are uh, used, are uh, one and the same. Uh, the uh, surfaces to uh, convey the teachings of the uh, church. So uh, the um, uh, stone mason that carved the different stones that made up the walls of the nave, the walls of the you know, aisles, were also the same uh, masons who uh, articulated the uh, entrance of the uh, churches, known as uh, portals that we you know, uh, see up uh, here, and then the articulation of the uh, portals. The uh, portal like a triumphal uh, arch, is an articulated uh, entry. The uh, entry into a uh, different domain in the church, from the, uh, the outside to the inside, from the uh, sinners, the uh, penitents, into the uh, holy uh, devout. So, symbolically, uh, uh, the uh, point of uh, entry is very significant. It's not just uh, a, a boundary of uh, a physical boundary of inside and outside. For this uh, reason, the uh, portal is highly articulated. Uh, the uh, part underneath the uh, arch uh, is uh, known as the uh, tympanum. Uh, there's a, a surface underneath the arch, which is the uh, tympanum which uh, in later uh, periods can become a pointed. I mean, it's a pointed uh, tympanum compared to the uh, semicircular one. And within the uh, tympanum, uh, you have uh, carved uh, reliefs showing you know, uh, Christ or showing uh, various uh, episodes in order to uh, influence 
all of those who are about to enter the uh, church. The uh, receding arches, just like the little piers that we saw uh, inside, give uh, depth to the, uh, the portal, uh, sometimes in a simple manner like this one, uh, sometimes in a more developed manner like this one. And each one of these receding the arches is called the uh, archivolt. So here, the archivolts are rather you know, uh, pointed, but each archivolt is uh, profusely uh, carved with uh, uh, decorations, uh, some of which have a uh, meaning. Similarly, the um, uh, depth of the uh, portal is uh, given with uh, the columns uh, or uh, the uh, supports for the uh, receding the arches, the uh, archivolts, and they are the uh, jams. And if uh, you have a, a wide lintel, a wide opening, you have a central support, which is called the uh, trumo. All the uh, jams, all the uh, pilasters or the uh, molded uh, supports for the uh, archivolts here, including the uh, archivolts, uh, the uh, timbre, the uh, lintel, and then the uh, trumo that the carriers they come into are surfaces to uh, receive uh, carvings. So uh, there is no mosaic here. It is the stonemason who uh, will uh, carve uh, all of uh, these uh, uh, stone you know, elements, visible and invisible, to uh, articulate the uh, church architecturally, but also to give a Christian uh, message. This is a holy uh, building, and the uh, carvings are very uh, appropriate in their finesse and sophistication to convey these uh, messages. Uh, uh, later on, there's another element in addition to the uh, portal, which is the uh, window. Huge, big, uh, circular uh, windows, commonly known as rose windows, because uh, they had uh, flower-like you know, uh, configurations. And uh, these uh, the openings were uh, covered with uh, thin you know, uh, traceries, often filled with stained uh, glass. And uh, that reaches uh, a level of sophistication in the uh, Gothic uh, period. So in every aspect, uh, you have the ingredients of the pointed arch, uh, even the um, uh, you know uh, archivolts, every element already in the Romanesque period, but it reaches it reaches a, a greater uh, sophistication in the uh, Gothic uh, period. So, uh, in uh, the, uh, the typical you know uh, church, which is uh, in the center of the town uh, city, uh, you have the uh, advertising elements of the uh, tower at the crossing, higher and higher and higher. Uh, towers uh, at the uh, entrance, signaling the majesty of the power of the church. And then, uh, once you see this from a uh, distance, as a focal element of the uh, town, then you will come closer to the uh, church, to the uh, portals, sometimes a single, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, triple, and uh, they would be uh, articulated with the uh, various uh, messages, uh, drawing you uh, closer. So uh, here, once you get closer to the uh, church, uh, you uh, come, and as you are about to uh, enter, you are uh, confronted with the uh, portals, which are uh, carved with these uh, religious uh, messages. So, uh, here, uh, in uh, uh, these various uh, examples uh, here, uh, you see uh, archivolts, uh, you see the uh, timpan, you see the uh, lintel, you see the uh, trumo, and then the uh, jams. Uh, here, uh, you see it uh, quite well in the form of uh, semi you know, <coughs> circles, uh, gradually uh, advertising. If we uh, look at this particular example, I think it will uh, be very uh, illustrative to convey the uh, power. I mean, the dogma of uh, Christian uh, teachings 
was uh, conveyed in a pictorial uh, way. This is the, uh, the church in the top. You don't need to remember the uh, name. Uh, but uh, you see uh, Christ in the center, a very flattened uh, Christ. And uh, symbolically speaking, to the uh, left-hand side, you have a depiction of the uh, kingdom of heaven. If you are good, well, uh, I mean, your uh, afterlife will be in the heaven. And then on the uh, others, you have hell. So what we saw in Saint Savior in the Korah, in the funerary uh, chapel, is being repeated here uh, as well. Uh, uh, Christ the uh, Savior pointing uh, the uh, key to being uh, good for the salvation of humanity. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, salvage, you know, go to the kingdom of uh, heaven, and then the penitents and the uh, sinners go to uh, hell. And uh, underneath, you have the uh, reign of, of the uh, souls. Uh, here you see that, you know, uh, also. And in fact, uh, here you even have some sarcophagi where the dead, you know, are being, you know, uh, taken uh, up and their souls are being uh, weighed <laughs> to decide whether they will go to uh, hell or uh, whether they will, you know, uh, uh, remain. It's uh, quite uh, clear uh, here, uh, the uh, weighing of the uh, souls, I hope you can, you know, uh, see it. And then there's a twisted and twirling, you know, uh, figures who are either, you know, marching to uh, hell or who are, uh, you know, found to be uh, good. Uh, here you see a, uh, an angel, uh, an angel and a uh, devil. They're both uh, uh, holding uh, scales, measuring the uh, souls, and then there's contorted, you know, uh, figures. Uh, they're uh, awaiting the uh, destiny. So this was a very powerful uh, spiritual uh, influence in the center of town, constantly you know, reminding uh, the people of the uh, power of uh, religion. And uh, the uh, stone uh, mason uh, put his uh, utmost uh, skill to create a, a higher and more impressive uh, church, but also to have finer you know, uh, carving that would uh, the, the articulate the uh, messages of the uh, church. Not only the uh, portal, not only the uh, rose uh, window, but even the capitals uh, sometimes receive the uh, narrative uh, stories um, which uh, would uh, give you know, messages to, to the uh, people. So every uh, surface of the uh, stone was utilized. Sometimes you have up to pay. Uh, horrifying figures like you know uh, this one, constantly uh, reminding of the dangers of uh, hell, and uh, reminding uh, the uh, penitents of uh, the, the uh, state of you know situation uh, there. Uh, I love uh, to see in the, some of the churches in England. You look at the you know uh, ceilings, and if you have binoculars. Uh, you can see these grotesque, you know, uh, figures, and they're ugly. I mean, they are meant to be, you know, uh, ugly, in order to uh, convey certain, you know, uh, messages about, you know, being good or uh, being, you know, uh, bad. And uh, the various uh, forms uh, this uh, took could uh, change on whether you were further in the north, in the, the Scandinavia, in uh, England, uh, France, or uh, Germany or whether you were in lands closer to, to uh, Italy. Uh, in uh, this example here, you see that uh, there is no point of art. Uh, the uh, early uh, inspiration that uh, we saw in the beginning of the uh, lecture, uh, utilizing uh, the uh, Roman memory, uh, the Roman vocabulary, or the memory of the Roman vocabulary, may be seen here too, I mean, a little bit, like a you know, triumphal uh, arch, uh, a distillation uh, of that. In saint Gilles de Gard, you don't need to remember the uh, name, it's almost like a triple arch, like a triumphal uh, arch, uh, the uh, attic, you know, story. But of course, there's nothing Roman about this. You have the receding arch walls, you have the uh, tympanum, but it gives you that sense of uh, ceremonial uh, entrance. Uh, what is uh, more uh, than that, 
in Italy itself, the course that the Romanesque and the Gothic uh, took is very different than uh, what we see in uh, uh, the uh, uh, stone-centered you know, uh, Germany and uh, France. In uh, San Miniato al Monte, you don't need to remember the uh, name, the uh, Romanesque you know, church uh, there has a semicircular arches, and uh, it's uh, a little bit like the uh, uh, interior of the Roman uh, bath. There are uh, marble uh, plaques and uh, polychromy in the uh, outside, and the facade of the uh, church, as you see uh, here, is just a facade. They have articulated the you know, facade here, not with the uh, portals that we just you know, uh, saw, but with a uh, polychromatic and uh, attention you know, uh, dividing, uh, patterned kind of uh, marble uh, design, which uh, shows that uh, the uh, Roman uh, memories are still alive here in a different way than uh, France and uh, Europe. But what is very interesting is that uh, they are <laughs> still, you know, utilizing the um, uh, the uh, wood uh, sort of uh, pitch the roof, despite the use of this uh, marble. And uh, looking at uh, this example, uh, you all notice this, I'm uh, sure. And uh, in this uh, church, uh, you would never uh, see it, something like this in uh, you know, Germany or in, uh, in uh, England. Uh, this is a rather Italian uh, church. Uh, you recognize the Pisa uh, tower and the uh, cathedral uh, there. Uh, it's rather different, but you still have the longitudinal name. You have the uh, crossing, but the uh, polychromy and the uh, external uh, articulation uh, has a rather distilled uh, Roman uh, influence uh, here. So uh, next uh, Monday, we shall look at the uh, Gothic episode. Thank you.